my colleagues to vote to strike this rider to bring clarity to a confusing issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I reserve the balance. Jim may not reserve. I don't Jim. reserve the balance. And uh, uh, how much time do I have, Mr. Chairman? Gentleman has one minute remaining. One minute. Well, then let me say, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this uh, has um, been an issue that has gone back and forth. And I understand that uh, the gentleman from Montana uh, would like to strike it. But the fact is that all of the groups involved have finally come together and realized uh, that they need clarity on a very difficult issue. There are times when uh, water goes underground during the summer and the surface dries up, but that water is still present. And much of that water is interstate. You need federal control. And one of the biggest things that I think perhaps the gentleman may not be aware of is the fact that this rider, if it is passed in this bill, uh, it would eliminate the agricultural exclusion for prior converted cropland. Now, that, uh, 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 there may be some uh, issues, but the fact is that uh, it in, this rider invalidates all rules that will, were issued after November 13, 1986. And it wasn't until 1993 that the Corps and EPA defined the waters of the U.S. to exclude prior converted cropland. So a, a lot of the farm community are going to be very upset if this uh, goes through. Uh, and the fact that 33 states have joined a brief uh, asking the federal government to do exactly what the EPA and uh, the Federal Corps of Engineers is doing uh, means Gentleman that uh, we are going to cause major problems if this rider uh, is passed expired. in this bill. And with that, uh, I, I uh, yield the balance of my time. Gentleman's Thank time has expired. Purpose does the gentleman from Montana rise? The gentleman from Montana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You heard it here first. My urban colleague says the federal government wants to control your water on private property in rural areas like Montana. The life of Mont Montana farmer is hard. Up before the sun rises and working all day just to make ends meet. Between the cycle of plowing, planting, and harvesting, there are tractors to fix, barns to repair, and products to bring to market. The last thing any Montana farmer needs is another federal mandate to follow, more red tape to cut through, and more federal paperwork to fill out. This country was founded by farmers. They understood from personal experience that farming is a full-time job, and you can't do it right if you only do it part of the time. So the framers of the Constitution set up a representative government that lets farmers elect men and women to fight on their behalf so they can go about their business. The House of Representatives was meant to be the closest to the people. It's not just our privilege to stand up for our Constitution. It's our constitutional duty. The Constitution delegates legislative power to the Congress. But lately, President Obama, and in too many cases, he has tried to circumvent the constitutional separation of powers. Congress managed to prevent the disastrous cap-and-trade energy tax from becoming law. So President Obama expanded the definition of a harmful pollutant in the Clean Air Act to include carbon dioxide, the stuff that we exhale. Congress blocked the massive legislative land grants like the Northern Rockies Ecosystem Protection Act. So the Obama administration crafts secret plans to designate 13 million acres as national monuments using the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act, by the way, was passed to protect archaeological sites. And now the Obama administration is looking to expand its reach over the objections of both the Congress and the Supreme Court to control water, all water, everywhere. You know, if there's one resource that's more important to dryland farmers than time, it's water. In an arid state like Montana, where we've got plenty of land, there's lots of dirt between light bulbs. The difference between feast and famine can be a little bit of water. And now some folks in the federal government want to get involved. It's been a long fight. Let me show you how we got there. Back in 2001 and 2003, the Supreme Court limited the authority of the federal government to regulate water. Unelected bureaucrats were trying to control water, all water, including melted snow, mud puddles, and prairie potholes and irrigation ditches. But the Supreme Court said no. This makes sense. There is a role for the federal government. We want clean water and a safe environment. But living in Montana means you live off the land. It means you grew up learning how to take care of your envi environment. In fact, Montanans were some of the first conservationists. But the role of government is not unlimited. We don't need the federal government thinking for us. 
and we don't need the federal government to tell us how to take care of our irrigation ditches. The Clean Water Act gives the federal government authority to regulate navigable waters of the United States. President Obama and his allies in Congress are trying to eliminate the requirement that waterways be navigable. Simply eliminating that word gives the federal government nearly unlimited power. Fortunately, those legislative efforts have failed. So in December 2010, the Corps of Engineers crafted a plan to identify water subject to jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. The goal is to significantly expand federal jurisdiction over water. The Obama administration and his allies are trying to solve a problem that does not exist. Fortunately, the Constitution provides a check to the Obama administration's power grab. Montana farmers have a safety net. The House of Representatives. It's our job to fight this battle so that they don't have to. It's our job to act as a check and balance to overreaching executive actions. That's what this language does. It simply prevents the president from carrying out his plans. It ensures that when a farmer wakes up before the sun rises, they don't have to worry about onerous federal regulation. They can just go to work on their farm. That's what the founding fathers would have wanted, and that's why I hope you'll join me in opposing this amendment. Thank you. Jim Neal's back. The purpose does the gentleman rise. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Without objection. I want to begin by expressing great respect and affection for my friend from Montana who has just spoken. It was a fine speech, but it has nothing to do with the issues before us. What the committee in this legislation has done has been to simply assure that the Corps of Engineers may not put forth guidelines clarifying the law as it was enunciated by the Supreme Court in the case that we are discussing in connection with the Clean Water Act. It does something more. It fixes it so that farmers will lose certain protections which have been put in for their benefit by the law. And you're going to find, as my friend from Maryland uh, has so wisely observed, that you are going to hurt a bunch of American farming public by denying them a protection which has been given them. Citizens under the language of the committee bill will have no way of knowing what the law is or how it is interpreted by the committee. It is not an issue before us today whether or not you agree with the Clean Water Act. The question is simply, is the Corps of Engineers going to be able to tell people what the law is and how it is to be interpreted by the Corps and how citizens will then have to behave. Under the law, the amendment simply says the Corps may inform people of what the law as set forth in the Supreme Court's rulings mean. I think that is something which is important in terms of seeing to it that people may go forward with their planning with economic development and everything of that sort. It is not wise to deny citizens this kind of information. It is extremely unwise to deny business the opportunity to know what it is they must do to comply with the law as enunciated by the Supreme Court. The amendment makes great sense. The bill as written simply refights an issue that is not before this body at this time. I hate to see the kind of confusion that is being inflicted upon this body by a simple misunderstanding of what the, the law is, what the bill does, and what the amendment does. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. If you want clarity, if you want people to know how to comply with the law as set forth by the Supreme Court, adopt the amendment. 
if you want confusion, and if you want misfortune to be visited on farmers and the public and confusion to afflict economic development and business, then support the bill as it is and oppose the amendment. There is a tremendous lack of wisdom here in this fight. Let us understand the issue that plagues us, and that is simply whether or not the Corps of Engineers is going to be able to tell people what the law is. An issue is not any change in the law. The amendment accepts the fact that the Supreme Court has made a decision. I happen to strongly disagree with that decision by the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, I am going to have to wait to some future time to come down and attack what is clear misbehavior by the Supreme Court. Because I was on the floor and had a colloquy with the management of the legislation at the time the bill was passed. And the Supreme Court has clearly disregarded and ignored the legislative history. And the clear and worse than that, the clear language of the bill. That issue is not before us today. What is before us today is simply is the Corps of Engineers and the U.S. government going to be able to tell the people what the law is as set forth by the Supreme Court. To say anything else about this legislation is either to be misled or to mislead. And I would beg my colleagues to vote in favor of the intelligent approach of seeing to it that we're going to allow people to know what the law is Inspired. and allow the Supreme, the Corps of Engineers to set out what the law is for the benefit of business, industry, and people. Gentleman's time has expired. What purpose does the gentleman rise? Uh, move, to stri move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise today in strong opposition to this amendment. My friends on the other side of the aisle are absolutely right that currently there is an assault going on the Clean Water Act, but it's not by us, but it's, rather it's by this administration. We are not trying to roll back the Clean Water Act, but instead allow it to work as it was, as it was written. This administration is currently trying to circumvent congressional intent and expand the scope of the law beyond its drafted words. This guidance would substantially change the agency's policy on waters subject to the jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, undermine the regulatory community's rights and obligations under the Clean Water Act, and erode the federal-state partnership that has long existed between states and federal government in implementing the Clean Water Act. By developing this guidance, the agencies have ignored calls from state agencies and environmental groups, among others, to proceed through the normal rulemaking procedures and have avoided consulting with the states, which are supposed to be the agencies partnering in implementing the Clean Water Act. The agencies cannot circumvent the Administrative Procedures Act through this guidance or change the scope and meaning of the Clean Water Act or the statutes implementing regulations. If the administration and the members of the other side of the aisle seek statutory changes in the Clean Water Act, then a proposal must be submitted here in Congress for legislative action and we should have healthy debate. Until that time, we must stop this current process. And also, I'd like to add uh, the gentleman's uh, earlier comments. I think the Clean Water Act, the intent of the Clean Water Act was passed, made cons passed constitutional muster because of the word navigable and with interstate commerce clause. And these guidances put out essentially circumvent the word navigable, so you have to raise into question the constitutionality of, 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 of this type of an amendment. So I urge uh, strong opposition to this amendment. And I yield back my time. The gentleman from Ohio yields back his time. What purpose does the gentlewoman from Maryland rise? Mr. Speaker, I rise to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of my colleague Mr. Moran's amendment to strike this rider in the fiscal year 2013 Energy and Water Development Appropriations Act. For 40 years, the Clean Water Act has helped remove pollution from our drinking water and protect our precious natural resources. The act regulates the discharge of pollution into navigable waters. But put simply, it makes sure that a glass of water you get from the tap 
or the fish you catch in any fishing hole or river isn't contaminated by pollutants. Now some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle forget that before the Clean Water Act was passed, rivers caught on fire, oil spilled in inland waters, and that was rampant, and few communities had modern wastewater treatment facilities. This ill-conceived rider in this bill would have a severe impact on my home state of Maryland. In fact, the EPA estimates that 55% of the streams in Maryland either do not flow year-round or are first, or, first order headwater streams. These are waters most vulnerable to pollution or destruction if the Army and the EPA are not, Army Corps and the EPA are not able to uh, adopt policies to restore long-standing protections for these waters. And without these protections, sewage and industrial waste discharges, oil spills, and completely filling in streams for development may not be subject to federal law, even when streams provide drinking water as they do in the 4th Congressional District of Maryland. EPA says that 3,990,016 people in Maryland receive some of their drinking water from areas containing these smaller streams. In Montgomery County alone, 1,846,500 residents are at risk of having their drinking water polluted. These residents use surface water supplied by public drinking water systems that rely on smaller streams that are at risk of losing clean water protections. Also, many waters in Maryland, from small streams to the Chesapeake Bay, are interstate waters. Without strong federal safeguards for waters of the United States, those states that want to or are able to take state-level steps to protect waters will be unsuccessful. Even with the Clean Water Act, the Potomac River, I live on the banks of the Potomac River, is listed as the most endangered river by the group American Rivers as part of their 2012 America's Most Endangered Rivers. The river receives this inauspicious award because it's polluted by agriculture runoff, sewage runoff from roadways, and enough pharm pharmaceuticals that male fish have been caught with female characteristics. The Anacostia River, which also flows through my district, is polluted by trash sewage and other contaminants. But a cleanup of the Anacostia is slowly taking place, due in no small part to the guidance provided under the Clean Water Act. Urban rivers like the Potomac and Anacostia are affected by runoff from streets and parking structures. And you know, I want to pause here for a minute because all of us here in this capital receive our water, our tap water and our drinking water from those waters that I'm talking about in the Anacostia and the Potomac. And so keep that in mind, uh, members of Congress, when you're drinking a glass of water. And it's one of the main, many reasons that I favor public transportation, transit-oriented development, and bike riding. Our air and water are protected when we make smart transportation decisions. And I have to say, in this Congress, we haven't made a single smart transportation and jobs decision in this Congress since the Republicans took over. But it's why I support a, support a bipartisan and Senate passed uh, MAP 21 and hope that conferees agree to a report that reflects the priorities in that bill because that's about protecting our drinking water. And so let's be clear about what's at stake. The Clean Water Act protects almost 60% of U.S. streams, and that's why 33 states joined a brief in the most recent Supreme Court case on the issue, urging the court to uphold federal protections for wetlands adjacent to non-navigable tributaries. Those states, these states noted that federal safeguards were critical because water flows between states because maintaining a federal floor of pollution control creates parity among states and because states have come to rely on federal protections and would face significant administrative and financial burdens if they were solely responsible for these requirements. Now the success of the Clean Water Act is being threatened by a dirty water rider attached to the fiscal 2013 Energy and Water Appropriations Bill. I hope you'll join with me and millions of people across the country to stand up for clean water, for safe drinking water, for the health of fishermen, and for fish and wildlife. Future generations will not, will not remember the industries we've made slightly wealthier by rolling back this bipartisan pass bill, but they will know, our future generations will know that we are the reason their drinking water is making them sick. I urge my colleagues to vote for the Moran Dingell Amendment and to strike this dangerous and reckless rider, and with that I yield. Gentlemen's time has expired.
What purpose does the gentlelwoman from Missouri rise? I move to strike the last word. The gentlelwoman from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I have to rise in strong opposition to my friend's uh, amendment uh, today. The EPA and the Corps of Engineers are writing guidance in order to dramatically expand the reach of the Clean Water Act and the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. The EPA and Corps' understanding of waters of the United States would grow to encompass in my rural district and a lot of rural districts all over this country dry ditches, culverts, and, you know, who knows, swimming pools and snow as well. Uh, this guidance is called Identification of Waters Protected by the Clean Water Act, and it's clear that the draft guidance, which has already been published, says it is not a rule and it is not binding. But let me tell you what's happened in my congressional district. Number one, this guidance is actually causing already the Corps of Engineers to fine a couple of people in, in my congressional district who supposedly have a, they have dry ditches on their, on their property, their personal property, and about, there are about 10 different streams removed from the Mississippi River, perhaps, and only when it rains does it stay wet for a day. And these people are being, are being told that they're going to have to pay hefty fines unless they stop, uh, they stop the uh, development of this particular area on their land. This is absolutely the craziest thing I've ever heard, you all. Nobody is talking about impacting your clean water. This is out in the country. This is in rural areas. This is where... There hasn't been a stream running in a hundred years. And why that would be called a navigable water is beyond me. The language included in the underlying bill is just simply going to stop the Corps, along with EPA, from expanding their regulatory reach. Uh, in, and in southern Missouri, the definition of waterways would, as I said, there, it's going to be drastically expanded to include culverts and and dry ditches, the rain falling on our fields. God knows there's going to be a mud puddle there and it's suddenly going to become a navigable water because you might be able to put a, somebody with an inner tube in there in the puddle on the yard to be able to swim until it dries up. I mean, come on, let's use sound science. Let's use some common sense. Let's follow proper rulemaking. Um, because the last thing we need to do is continue to increase the power of the federal government. And, and this amendment under consideration, and I love my colleagues who are, who are offering it, but it would further empower the regulatory agencies and it would endanger more than anything else our private property rights. So, Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support private property rights and join me in demanding transparency and accountability of our regulatory agencies. And I urge my colleagues to vote no to defeat this amendment. Yield back. Yields back or time. The question is on the amendment offered. Go ahead. Gentleman from Washington. Indiana. Gentleman from Indiana. Strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Appreciate the uh, recognition. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise in uh, strong support of Mr. Moran's amendment uh, and would point out that I think the gentleman from Michigan in his earlier remarks uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, this is an issue of clarity uh, versus confusion. Uh, and the fact is we have become the Congress of confusion. Uh, we are charged with running a nation with 300 million people with domestic and international responsibilities. Uh, we have now confused the physician community of the United States more than 17 times, sometimes at a two-week interval, as to what the reimbursements are going to be under the Medicare program. Uh, we have people uh, who have suffered loss of life, significant property damage, and dislocation through floods in our nation. We are unable as an institution uh, to resolve our differences on flood insurance and have continued it, if I am correct, at least 11 times. Uh, the fact is uh, we have an infrastructure as far as our highways and bridges that are crumbling. We have now eight or nine times continued that because we cannot make a decision and we continue to confuse the states, contractors, and our communities as to what the policy of the United States government is going to be. And depending on what year you died, 
the last four years, including 2012, this nation has had three different estate tax laws, and the current one expires at the end of this year, leading to confusion in the hiring of numerous accountants, insurance agents, and attorneys, all of whom I love. Why confuse this nation more by not adopting the clarity of the Moran Amendment? There is no question that the two Supreme Court decisions uh, have significantly confused this issue and created uncertainty as to the scope of the Clean Water Act. During multiple hearings before the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, witness after witness spoke of how these cases have blurred the lines on what the waters subject to federal protection are. The reason, in short, is because neither case could the majority of Supreme Court justices agree on what was the appropriate test for determining the scope of federal protections based on their reading of the term navigable? No majority of the court could agree what navigable means. In fact, in one of the cases, the level of confusion on the court is reflected in that there are five separate opinions filed in the case with no opinion having more than four supporters on the Supreme Court of the United States. The resulting confusion in interpreting the Clean Water Act is apparent to both the regulated community and the regulators. Fact is, the industry has asked for clarification of this confusion through agency rulemaking. The gentlewoman uh, mentioned uh, we need a rule in this. We do need a clarified rule. Uh, however, this legislative writer that is in the bill proposes the status quo of confusion and that that is acceptable. Uh, it will only result in increased implementation costs to the federal government, to the states, uh, to the regulated community. It will increase delays in the implementation of important public works projects, protracted litigation on the disparity of this language. Uh, we need to adopt Mr. Moran's amendment uh, to ensure that we have clarity. We should be taking uh, actions to address the legitimate concerns that have been expressed. Uh, but the fact is that this is an issue that Congress and the administration needs to address in the authorizing process to clarify it. This is not an issue that should be continued in confusion, in perpetuity, through the appropriations process. And therefore, again, I strongly support the gentleman's amendment and would yield back my time. Thanks. The gentleman yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the amendment and urge my colleagues to support a clarification of the Clean Water Act. Mr. Chairman, Republican administrators of the EPA, from William Riley to Russell Train, have all expressed support for protecting our streams, rivers, wetlands, lakes, and other waters of the United States from pollution and from destruction. The rider in this bill will, in my view, perpetuate the current confusing and cumbersome bureaucratic situation. I would suggest it's time to take a step forward, not take a step backward, and I urge my colleagues to oppose the rider and to support the amendment. Yield back. Pennsylvania yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Washington rise? I rise in uh, opposition to the amendment and uh, ask for strike the regular recorded record the uh, required number of words. The gentleman from Washington is recognized for five. Uh, I received a letter from the American Fisheries Society, the American Fly Fishing Trade Association, the American Sport Fishing Association, backcountry hunters and anglers. Uh, I think these are very important groups. As a Westerner, I pay attention to these people. Uh, it says, Dear Representative, as sportsmen and conservation organizations representing millions of hunters, boaters, and anglers nationwide, we ask you to oppose any legislation that would block the administration's very deliberate and vital actions to clarify and restore long-standing Clean Water Act protection for streams and wetlands across the country. We reaffirm our support for Clean Water Act guidance currently being reviewed and finalized 
in an interagency process coordinated by the Office of Management and Budget. Sportsmen rely on clean water to ensure the opportunity to enjoy hunting, angling, and other outdoor-based recreation and business in the great outdoors. When wetlands are drained and filled and streams are polluted, sportsmen are often the first to be directly impacted. Consequently, hunters, boaters, and anglers have consistently advocated for conserving our nation's waters. Since 2001, the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Swank 2001 and Rapanos 2006, along with the 2003-2008 agency guidance that is inconsistent with these decisions and the related science, have combined to erode long-standing Clean Water Act safeguards for headwater streams and critical wetlands. Headwater and intermittently flowing streams comprise 59% of all streams in the continental United States and are particularly vulnerable under the decisions and existing agency guidance. I would also point out that using data from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the American Sport Fishing Association estimates angling generates $125 billion in annual economic activity and supports more than one million jobs. Using similar information, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation estimates hunters contribute nearly $25 billion to the economy, which supports 600,000 jobs. Data from the National Marine Manufacturers Association indicates that recreational boating contributes over $41 billion and 337,000 jobs to the U.S. economy. The Fish and Wildlife Service reports duck hunting alone generates $2.3 billion for the economy and every year and supports 27,000 private sector jobs. In order to effectively safeguard key components of our economy, the sports and traditions that millions of Americans enjoy, and the health and integrity of some of our most important fish and wildlife resources, it is essential to act now to restore lost Clean Water Act protection consistent with this existing law and protection. The Army Corps of Engineers and Environmental Protection Agency proposed new guidance last year for determining Clean Water Act jurisdiction. The draft guidance is science-based and clearly respects the Supreme Court's decision. Over the course of three months last summer, the agency conducted an almost unprecedented public engagement process for a guidance document. More than 200,000 Americans commented, and EPA had reported that the clear majority of those comments support the proposed guidance. During this process, more than 250 hunting, angling, and conservation groups from 28 states all weighed in backing the guidance and subsequent rulemaking. To complete the process, the guidance must be finalized as a first step in affirming longstanding clean water protection for many wetlands and streams. The guidance importantly maintains existing exemptions for normal agricultural activity. At the same time, it would provide clarity and consistency that is badly needed by landowners, developers, conservation, and state and federal agencies alike. We urge you to support and not oppose this important first step. So that's why we must today enact the Moran Amendment that takes out the language added, in, unfortunately added in full committee on this subject. It is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do from an environmental perspective and from a hunter, fisherman, outdoor recreational perspective. It's necessary to protect our future. I, uh, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Washington yields back his time. What purpose does the gentleman from Idaho rise? Strike the records a number of words. The gentleman from Idaho is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman for his, uh, for his recognition. I, I don't have a letter to read. Uh, I'd ask unanimous consent that the gentleman's letter be included in the record because I'm not sure I heard all of it. But <laughs> I'd be delighted to share with my friend from Idaho, the distinguished chairman of the Interior Subcommittee, a I copy it. of this letter I and of all that. of the signatories. I appreciate that very much. Listen, the only argument that's being made here that makes any sense 
is we've got to bring clarity to this issue. We've got to bring clarity to the confusion of this issue. Well, I will tell you that a hanging is clarity, but it's not necessarily the right option. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We're giving control of all of these waters that have traditionally been under control of the states to the federal government. Now, I will tell you we will have an opportunity to debate this same issue again on the Interior Bill dealing with the EPA. This deals with the Army Corps of Engineers. But the fact is, is that you don't need this to clarify this, the policies proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers. You can clarify it by legislatively defining what navigable means. If the Supreme Court has a problem trying to decide what navigable means, then let's address that so that they know what we intend by that. The argument is made repeatedly by some of those that have, opposed, that have supported this amendment, whether you're from Virginia or Maryland. And I will tell you, if you want in Virginia or Maryland or Washington or Michigan, the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA to control every drop of water that falls on your state, I'll help you do it. Let's write legislation to do that so that you guys can have the clarity of the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers. But in western states, we actually protect those waters by state law. And what you're trying to do is exempt state law or override state law and have the federal government take over control of these, and that's just flat wrong. And if you don't think Virginia protects its headwaters enough, then put a bill in to allow the EPA and the, and the Army Corps to control every drop of water that falls on the state of Virginia. You don't need this to, inform, to, to bring clarity to this, and the states are doing a good job that do state regulation of headwaters. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask the gentleman what we do about waters that are interstate, which comprises most of the waters. They, they flow down from Well, states. let me answer that question yes. for you. Let me answer that yes, question please. for you. Cause if there are waters that the state is not regulating and they will eventually flow into navigable waters, and the only way to control the pollution in those navigable waters the state is going to ultimately start controlling those headwaters if they're not doing their job. You but, seem to think that states have no ability to control the state waters that are under state control. They do have the ability to control those state waters. And they do a good job of it in most states. I'm not sure about Virginia. I haven't followed Virginia. But, uh, but I suggest to the gentleman, they use the federal definition in order to enforce the quality of the water coming from other states. That's the problem. The, 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 point, water, the, the point is that they become navigable waters at some point. If they are being polluted by, state, by waters that are controlled by the states, eventually the state is going to have to say, you know what, we've got to get control of this, otherwise we're going to have problems downstream. But how do they control you think that you, water to have from another tendency, state? You think the only way to address this problem is to have a federal bureaucracy. You know what? We could bring clarity to all of our problems by just eliminating the states. Why have states? Why not have everything under federal control? That makes sense because everything goes from state to state eventually. Well, it makes no sense to me. This does not bring clarity to the situation and it does not help in the regulation of our Clean Water Act. This does not make the waters of the United States cleaner. All it does is give more authority to the Army Corps of Engineers and the EPA. If you want to bring clarity, then bring a bill down here to define what navigable means. And you can do that. As I said, a hanging is clarity. Not necessarily the best outcome. If my I yield back the balance okay. of my time. Goes back his time. Anyone seek recognition? The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote on that. <laughs> Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment. I, I didn't hear the chairman correctly. Uh, the, if the ayes had it, I, I withdraw that request. The gentleman from Montana has requested a vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia will be postponed. Clerk will read.
page 12, line 15, section 111. As of the date of enactment of this act, the Secretary shall not promulgate or enforce any regulation that prohibits an individual from possessing a firearm at a water resources development project if the individual is not otherwise prohibited by law from possessing the firearm. Title II, Department of the Interior, Central Utah Project, Central Utah Project Completion Account, $19,700,000. For fiscal year 2013, the Commission may use an amount not to exceed $1,500,000 for administrative expenses. Bureau of Reclamation. Appropriations shall be expended to execute authorized functions of the Bureau of Reclamation. Water and Related Resources, $833,635,000. Central Valley Project Restoration Fund, $39,883,000. California Bay Delta Restoration, $36 million. Policy and Administration, to remain available until September 30, 2014, $57 million. Administrative Provision, appropriations for the Bureau of Reclamation shall be available for purchase of five passenger motor vehicles for replacement only. General Provisions, Department of the Interior, Section 201. None of the funds shall be available through a repro reprogramming of funds that creates or initiates a new program, project, or activity. Section 202. None of the funds may be used to determine the final point of discharge for the inceptor drain for the San Luis unit development of a plan to minimize any detrimental effect of the San Luis drainage waters. Title III, Department of Energy, Energy Programs, $1,450,960,000. Clerk will suspend. What purpose does the gentlewoman from Ohio rise? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise to um, um, move to strike the last word. Does the gentlewoman from Ohio have an amendment? I have an amendment at the desk, sir. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Captor of Ohio, page 20, line 15, after the dollar amount, insert increase by $10 million. Page 28, line 16, after I the dollar the amount, amendment insert reduced by $10 read. million. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman. I rise today to offer an amendment that takes another step toward restoring energy independence for America and new jobs for Americans. My amendment shifts an additional $10 million for energy efficiency and renewable energy development from departmental administrative accounts. My goal is to better support a diversified energy portfolio and restore continental energy security. American security and competitiveness hinge on affordable energy for our businesses and families, and our energy future depends upon innovation. Fossil fuels continue to provide the bulk of our energy needs and those accounts are left intact in this bill. But we all should know that a diversified energy portfolio protects America from the instability of a single source of energy dependence. Our future security depends on diversified energy research and development that provides significant return on investment, both financially and in technological advancement and the jobs that go with it. We must ensure that American innovators are on a level playing field with competitors across the globe, including China and even Russia and other nations looking for a competitive edge. For years, the United States has been the global leader in these technologies, but we now are losing edge. Investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies are absolutely essential in securing America's future. Now, I understand the difficulty in drafting this bill, given the 302B allocation and the cuts for energy and water that the subcommittee endured, and I appreciate Chairman Freelingheisen and Ranking Member Visklosky's dedication to making difficult choices in a tight budget climate. Yet for fiscal 13, 2013, critical energy research accounts have been drastically reduced to $1.38 billion in, um, that actually exacted a $428 million cut below 
this fiscal year of 2012. Compared to last year, for example, solar energy was cut nearly in half to $155 million, and wind energy, the fastest energy sector growing globally, was cut by one quarter to $70 million for R&D. Other programs like geothermal, water power, and building energy technologies received similar large cuts. Last year, this body came together in a bipartisan fashion to support a modest increase in energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies. And faced with further cuts this year, I ask my colleagues to reaffirm that commitment to a diversified energy policy and lead our country and indeed the world toward a new energy age. In fact, this amendment increases funds for the renewable portion of our energy portfolio while maintaining the proposed increases for fossil fuel development. And from a budgetary and accounting standpoint, my amendment actually decreases outlays for fiscal year 2013. Let me add this $10 million transfer we are proposing represents less than 1 20th of the $230 million administrative budget of the Department of Energy. This is a prudent adjustment to our energy policy strategy. It is forward-looking. It makes sense from a budgetary standpoint, and I urge my colleagues' support. Mr. Gentlewoman Chairman, I reserve my, the balance of my time. Yeah, gentlewoman may not reserve. Do you yield back? Gentlewoman may not reserve the balance oh, of her sorry. time. Oh, sorry. I yield back my remaining gentlewoman time. Gentlewoman yields back her time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I rise to oppose, oppose the gentlewoman's amendment. Uh, I appreciate my uh, colleague's uh, passion for solar energy. She has been a tireless supporter of American innovation in this energy technological area. And I also have the pleasure of serving with her on the Defense Appropriations Committee, and she's been an innovator and promoter of uh, responsible energy po party, uh, policy with the Department of Defense as well. But within tight budgets, we need to focus funding on our higher pr highest priorities, which is what we've done in our energy and water bill. To make room for our national security and infrastructure responsibility, our bill cuts energy efficiency and renewable energy by $428 million and reprioritizes funds within the program to support American manufacturing and address rising gas prices. The focus is on jobs, the economy, American manufacturing. Our bill also preserves $155 million for solar energy research that continues to advance American manufacturing and help our, helps our companies compete globally. And while I support activities that help American manufacturers com compete, we cannot afford to add unnecessary funds to solar energy by cutting other important priorities. Indeed, the amendment would depart, depart, cut departmental administration, a cut that we all know that, that simply cannot be sustained in the final appropriation without jeopardizing the Department of Energy's ability to run and oversee their operations. They have enough management problems now. Reducing that management amount would make it difficult for them to, to run and oversee the problems that they really need to oversee. So this amendment uses money we simply did not have. It has perhaps the effects of crippling management by the department. We lived in, need to live within our means. And I regretfully oppose the gentlewoman's amendment and yield back. Chairman yields back. Gentleman from Indiana, seek recognition. Chairman, move to strike the last word. Gentleman from Indiana is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman, I uh, rise in strong support of the gentlewoman's amendment. Uh, there is $10 million uh, contained in her amendment. Uh, that is a significant sum of money. Uh, when compared, however, to current year level spending for the renewable accounts of $1,825,000,000, and as the chairman rightfully pointed out, a reduction of $428 million from that account, the gentlewoman's uh, amendment is as much a statement uh, of Congress uh, as it is a monetary initiative. Uh, that is, we need to make an investment in our energy uh, future uh, as well as our economic future. Renewable energy must be a part of that future, and the vast majority of industries in our country throughout our history have received substantial support from the government 
to become established and to be part of this great nation. Uh, this amendment to offer by the gentlewoman from Ohio takes a very small but very positive step uh, towards making that investment, and I do urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the amendment, and I would yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Ohio. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Ohio will be postponed. What purpose does the gentleman from Illinois rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Holkren of Illinois, page 20, line 15, after the dollar amount insert reduced by $30 million. Page 26, line 2, after the dollar amount insert increased by $15 million. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment would transfer $15 million from the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Research Program to the Office of Science. It would also reduce the EERE account by an additional $15 million, which could be put towards deficit reduction. The Obama administration has consistently prioritized industrial policy under the guise of applied science at the cost of reduced support for our nation's critical basic science research and our national labs. EERE's Advanced Manufacturing Office is $35 million above current fiscal year 12 levels. EERE's Water Technologies Program is $25 million above the President's budget request. EERE's Vehicle Technologies Program is $42 million above where it was just last year. EERE's Solar Technology Program receives $155 million despite billions of dollars of recent loan guarantees to solar companies and several high-profile industry failures. This amendment would remove $15 million from EERE account, which is spent on subsidizing solar power and wind energy, and move it back to the Office of Science, where it would uh, hope uh, report language uh, could, uh, I would hope that uh, language would be reported that could specifically target it for the high energy physics program, uh, which is critical to our long term economic success and scientific le leadership. Uh, at this time, I'd like to yield to my colleague from South Dakota, uh, Representative Christine Ohm. General Ohm, South Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to thank the gentleman from Illinois for yielding to me, and I appreciate working with him on this important amendment. This amendment would increase uh, funding for the Office of Science by $15 million while cutting an additional $15 million from the underlying bill. Mr. Chair, the field of high energy physics is becoming increasingly competitive, and without critical deep underground research spaces, we will continue to put our historic leadership in this area at risk while continuing to spend, send our best and our brightest overseas to conduct their research. But we can compete. Uh, just this week in my state of South Dakota, the Sanford Underground Research Facility dedicated the Davis campus, 4,850 feet underground. Later this year, this campus is scheduled to hold a dark matter research detector that after only four days of operation stands to add more to our knowledge than all previous dark matter research experiments. We're not talking about subsidies and giveaways for ideas that are years or are decades down the road. This is cutting edge science that's within our grasp. We need to make tough choices in our current budget situation, but we also need to recognize the role the U.S. research plays in our ability to compete and to innovate. So I urge my colleagues to support our ability to lead the world in underground science in a fiscally responsible way, and I urge support of this amendment. Gentlewoman, yield back. back. Gentlewoman yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I uh, move to strike the last word. Gentleman from Illinois still has the time. Mr. Does Chairman, I yield back from Illinois. Yes, uh, you just, have some extra time. I'm sorry, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I do urge adoption of uh, this amendment. Uh, it does make sense. It's a commitment to basic scientific research and fiscal accountability, and I would urge support of this. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the word. Last Gentleman's word. recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I arise very uh, reluctantly to oppose the amendment. Uh, I, I do recognize the, the passion of uh, the members of Congress from Illinois and South Dakota who have spoken and have, uh, I may say, repeatedly spoken and advocated to me over the last 
couple of months uh, on behalf of the uh, high energy physics program and, and uh, national laboratories in their congressional district and in fact uh, all relevant national laboratories that play a critical role in maintaining our nation's scientific leadership and competitiveness. So I, I recognize their advocacy, I, I appreciate it, and I certainly will be working with them to do whatever we can to be of assistance. We tried our very best in our bill to help those and all of the departments for remarkable national laboratories, but our constraints did not afford us the luxury of bringing more money to the table in many cases, and, and many labs wanted money and these are remarkable labs and, and they de they're deserving as well. We did what we could for high energy physics by shifting $16 million into project engineering and design for the long baseline neutrino experiment. This allows the department to move quickly in choosing a path forward for the program. We also ensured that the home state mine, which is a remarkable mine and a, and a remarkable structure and a, and a national asset, has sufficient minimal funding to operate while that path forward is yet to be determined. If more funding were available, we certainly would have brought more resources to bear. Unfortunately, an amendment finds resources by cutting a program, and we've discussed this earlier, that has already been reduced by $428 million. That's a 24 percent reduction from fiscal year 2012 and a 40 percent reduction below 2010. I recognize, the committee recognizes, the importance of these programs, and I promise we'll work uh, with our colleagues as we move forward in the appropriations process to be supportive and helpful, but I must reluctantly oppose the amendment. Mr. Gentleman, yield back. Yield back. The gentleman from uh, Indiana. Chairman moves to strike last word. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized five minutes. Chairman uh, would also rise in reluctant opposition to the gentleman's amendment uh, as a resident of the neighboring state to realize all the great scientific research that is done in the state of Illinois alone and some of our wonderful federal facilities. Uh, there is no question that we need to invest in the science account. The fact is in this bill, and again we had a very difficult allocation, science is cut by $72,203,000. But unfortunately, I do think the gentleman's uh, amendment is counterproductive in that he, because of the budget rules, uh, needs a $30 million cut uh, from renewable research uh, to gain a $15 million uh, ad for scientific research. Uh, given the constraints we face, uh, I think that's a bad bargain, and we ought to leave the $30 million right where it is and have that aptly applied. With that, I would yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time. <coughs> the questions on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Yeah. Gentleman from Washington. Wait, well, we ask for a record vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois will be postponed. For purpose, does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Will the uh, gentleman specify as to which of the amendments? I believe it's uh, amendment number six. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number six printed in the congressional record offered by Mr. McClintock of California. The gentleman from uh, California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment saves nearly one and a half billion dollars by ending the failed energy efficiency and renewable energy program. If we're serious about an all of the above energy policy, we have got to stop using taxpayer money to pick winners and losers based on political connections. Instead, we need to require every energy company to compete on its own merit as decided by the customers it attracts by offering better products at lower cost. For too long, we have suffered from the conceit that politicians can make better energy investments with taxpayer money than investors can make with their own money. It's this conceit that's produced the continuing spectacle of collapsing energy scandals epitomized by the Solyndra fiasco. And at least Solyndra was funded from a loan program in which the public has a chance to get some of its money back when these dubious schemes go bankrupt. 
This program is direct spending that funds commercialization projects for ideological pleasing technologies and the politically favored firms that make them money that taxpayers have no chance of recovering after it's spent. Uh, this amendment and the two that I will offer soon uh, protect taxpayers from being forced into being venture capitalists by incompetent politicians. It gets government out of the energy business and requires all energy companies and all energy technologies to compete equally and on their own merits. Most of the money in this program goes to wind, solar, and car research and development subsidies. We're told that's necessary to nurture these new and promising technologies. Well, these technologies are not new and they are not promising. Photovoltaic cells, for example, were invented by French physicist Edmond Besquerel in 1839. And in more than 170 years of technological research and innovation and billions of dollars of taxpayer subsidies, we have not yet invented a more expensive way to produce electricity. So we hide its true costs to consumers through subsidies taken from their taxes. Nor is there any earthly reason why taxpayers should be forced to serve as the research and development department for General Motors or for any other company or technology. And we're told that, well, someday, someday this research might pay us back many times over. We've been told that for 40 years. Now, I hope someday that these empty promises will be redeemed, but that's still not a reason for taxpayers to foot the bill. It's a reason for the actual research and development to be paid for by the companies that will profit from this long-promised breakthrough. And if they're not willing to finance it with their own money, we have no business forcing our constituents to finance it with theirs. All we've accomplished with these programs is to take dollars that would have naturally flowed into the most effective and promising technologies and divert them instead to those that are politically favored. This misallocation of resources not only destroys jobs and productive ventures, it ends up minimizing our energy potential instead of maximizing it and destroying our wealth instead of creating it. Madam Chairman, voters entrusted Republicans with the House majority with the very specific mandate to stop wasting money. Moreover, the House is where spending bills must originate. The government doesn't spend a dollar unless the House says that it will spend a dollar. A day doesn't go by that we don't hear an indictment of Solyndra and its multiplying scandals. And yet here we have the Republican Energy Appropriations Bill that continues to shovel billions of dollars on the very same folly that produced Solyndra. Politicians love to appear at ribbon cuttings and issue self-congratulatory press releases at government-supported alternative energy businesses, but they fall strangely silent when asked to actually account for the billions of our dollars that they've wasted. Well, that day of reckoning has arrived. These policies are impoverishing our country. Our taxpayers are exhausted. Our treasury is empty. It is time, it is past time, that this House majority proved worthy of the trust the American people gave it more than a year and a half ago. I yield back. Yields back. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, Madam Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes.